Okay, so um, this is becoming a very, well, it's always been an important uh, topic, but um, improving reproducibility through your better software practices. Um, it's always been important, but it's becoming more visible. And uh, uh, so we'll, um, and there's our license again. But the, a lot of times there's different terminology and historically it's been blurred a little bit. These are some of the terms that you might hear. Uh, of course, reproducibility, replicability, reliability, correctness, accuracy, transparency, and credibility. And they are all related, um, but uh, we'll just talk about some of them. The biggest definition that we need to look at is um, there was a difference between reproducible and replicable uh, between different uh, organizations and there's become more of a, a consensus on these and working towards that. And you can look at these documents if you wanna know a little bit about that history. But <clears throat> what the definitions are is that reproducible is when another team can obtain the same results that you did using um, or the author of whatever uh, source this is using the same environment for the experiments. Where replicable is when a team takes a slightly a different environment and they obtain consistent results that may be slightly different, but you can, you can um, see why because of the uh, actual environment was a little different. So why is this important? I would imagine most of you know why that's important, why you would want to be able to reproduce your results or somebody else would. <laughs> but uh, here's a, an example of when the psychology um, findings were not as strong as claimed. And this was highlighted by the New York Times and it wasn't uh, a really good example and it, it makes people doubt your work. Uh, this is only one of the examples. And in the past, uh, computational science had kind of been spared the spotlight, but uh, David showed you a couple examples earlier of some catastrophic things that happened. So uh, it's very important that uh, we can see reproducible, uh, be able to reproduce experiments. Uh, there was a seven year war over this example, uh, over the supercooled water uh, properties. And so in 2009, David and Nettie said that there were, in his report, that there were two possible phases, both high or low. And then in 2011, Chandler at Berkeley uh, redid some experiments and he came out with uh, that there was only one phase, which was high density. Uh, this was published in Nature and they said that if you want to, uh, to reproduce this, uh, will give you the codes and the scripts, uh, but they didn't ask for them, give them out. And so uh, Debit and Nettie with the, his, the, his colleague Palmer asked them to send the code. They didn't, they had to appeal to the publication. And then when they got the, that to see why they got different results, uh, Palmer found a, a feature in Berkeley that was used to speed up lamps. And when he put in a more standard report um, approach back into it, he obtained the same results that um, Deba Donetti had gotten in 2009. The resolution of this took seven years. So, uh, and Palmer, this quote, there's no way you could reproduce the Berkeley team's algorithm the way they had implemented their code from reading their paper. So it's very important that you uh, have a way of people being able to reproduce or at least replicate your result, their, uh, the results that you got. And um, so uh, what could they have done here? Um, they could have, um, we're gonna see where um, both publishers and other venues are asking for those types of things. Another example is this Python scripts that uh, used a glob module for these um, nuclear magnetic resonance data. And um, the dependence on the order of the listing of these the files made the results different. And the GLAD module actually ordered it differently whether or not you were running on Windows or I mean on Linux or Mac or Mojave. And so um, 
this could have this cast doubt on the results of over 150 papers. And what could have saved this? A unit test could have, making sure the tests were run on the both platforms, any platform that you think that your user are going to use this on would have helped with that. Um, but so we have to be careful in our uh, science software development. Again, we want to highlight our fundamental uh, idea through this whole tutorial, which is science through computing is at, be at best as credible as the software that produces it. So I guess we should all have that on our mirrors, right? <laughs> um, now there are, um, there are some incentives for paying attention to reproducibility. Um, however, a lot of times you'll just, you get under pressure. I was talking to a, um, a student earlier and we have these pressures on us to get a paper submitted. Uh, you need to get published, complete your pro this project. Uh, and at my lab, most of the developers are on several projects and they get pulled away on one. And so they don't uh, get to those things. Uh, so that's where your employer might value things uh, more. Uh, they don't see all the things that you're working on that will help with this type of activity. But the goal is that we want to change the incentives to include valuing of better software and that way we'll have better science. This is a long-term goal and it requires uh, a culture change. We've talked about that a little bit uh, before. It's in the early stages. We're working on it. A lot of different organizations are working towards this. Um, the other thing is supercomputer cycles are scarce resources. And when we're thinking about HPC and you're talking about these long uh, running simulations, you don't want to have to run them two or three times to make sure that the results are correct. And uh, that happens. And sometimes you still don't have correct results. So uh, the other thing is you need to have confidence in your results yourself. You need to be able to project that confidence to your sponsors, your boss or your advisor. Um, and then of course, reviewers, referees, and also to the, those who will be reading your publications and using your results. Um, need to think about how you would build this credibility without having to repeat these expensive runs. Um, and so there are also expectations for your data nowadays. There are data management plans. Uh, most research sponsors are now requiring these as part of the proposal. And there are times when they'll look at policies uh, during the proposal review, may uh, decide on the award negotiations and uh, conditions depend on them. And, and there are some, some support and incentives. Uh, you can see this um, example from the uh, NSF on dissemination and sharing of research, re research results. Uh, some of the things are to publish promptly, share your data, and things, the supporting material early, uh, making sure that you still have your legal rights. And then there's the fair data principles, which uh, are, that stands for findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse reusability. So this addresses um, publishers so that keep the maximum use of research data can be uh, done. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you are, are deal with this type of where, where you can get data, how, what you need, and or how you can give it to those that will be using it. So you can go to gofair.us for that. That's one of the areas. Um, Supercomputing Conference has the reproducibility initiative. They have two appendices, an artifact description. Uh, this is the mandatory since uh, SC19. Uh, and it uh, makes it easier for someone to rerun the computations you did or even for you to do that. Uh, it's a, you give a blueprint for setting up the experiments. Um, and it's, this is all largely auto-generated in the submission and uh, accepted papers are evaluated by reviewers. Uh, also an option is artifact evaluation and this also improves the trustworthiness, the rigor, uh, showing how your paper uh, really has 
um, that built into it. And so you can get more details at the site. Other publishers are adding uh, reproducibility to their uh, requirements. Um, ACM, TOMS, and TOMAX. Uh, also, there's ACM badging, uh, which helps with uh, the recognition of what kind of rigor that the publication went through. Um, other conferences have artifact evaluations, and we have this site here that has quite a few of them. And then there's also the NISO Committee on Reproducibility and Badging. Um, this is a little bit more on the AC Tom's reproducible computational results. Um, it's an option. There's a standard reviewer still, that, that, that hasn't changed, but there's an RCR reviewer assignment and that happens alongside of the standard review and it starts as early as possible. Uh, this, this reviewer knows and works with the author to get the, their experiments set up and um, this could be multifaceted, and so the author has to trust the reviewer, the publication does. Um, the referee is acknowledged, and they actually, uh, it appears, the report, their report appears with the published manuscript, so they get recognition. So this is a, a good start on helping those in the uh, science community to get some recognition for that work. It's It can be a lot of work, so um, it has and that also adds credibility to both the journal, to the publication itself. And then, of course, the reviewer gets um, some recognition too. So what we want is we want to create this virtuous cycle where the transparency and reproducibility requirements demand productivity and sustainability investments. And then those enable more. And so we get this... Uh, um, virtuous cycle and that way that reproducibility is based on good software development practices and that gives us good experimental practices. So how do we improve reproducibility in our own projects? So there are three phases. There's during the software development, after the software development, and during uh, experimentation and actually after that too. <laughs> um, so first of all, solid versioning practices are fundamental to reproducibility. If you don't know where the version of your code came from, you're not gonna be able to reproduce it. So you need to have your version, uh, your code under version control. Uh, also any documentation and even other artifacts should be under version control. Uh, frequent commits help with that. Uh, um, I talked about the Git workflows. Often you'll have a development branch where you can do those frequent commits. And then as your product uh, matures, you can put it into a more stable uh, branch. Um, put those version, that inf versioning information in your key outputs so that you can go back to an experiment and find out what you actually used. Uh, version number, uh, you could use commit hashes, which makes it even more specific. Um, might not be as meaningful to the human person, but you can get to that actual commit from that. Um, and if you if you have to, you should not have to modify the version from the repository. It should be somewhere in the repository. Um, but if you have to, at least keep track of it. Uh, maintain your documentation and other artifacts and sync with the code. Uh, David was talking about that with the uh, test and, and document controlled um, code development. Uh, that's a good way of doing it. Um, if you try to do it um, separately or you're going to make time later, you won't. You'll forget it or you won't have time to go back. Other, we go back to that very first slide where other things become more important and then it doesn't happen. Uh, another thing is to build quality and quality from the start. Uh, define following coding standards. It's not just code style that's important, but there are other things uh, you need to have expectation for the kinds and extent of documentation. Uh, we talked about that with the example of the 
the person who had too much documentation. So it, it's helpful to know what ex expected as far as documentation. Um, also, what are the types and rigor of the tests that you will be using? What's the schedule, that type of thing. And then again, we're back to this uh, develop test as you code, write the test while the code is still fresh in your mind. If you are doing something to the code, you're probably testing it. You may be doing it manually. So write that into a test and, and put that in your testing system. Or you can use the test driven development where you write the test first and code to the tests and then make sure that they work. <clears throat> um, also requiring rigorous testing as it becomes more public. This is what Dave was talking about with it, your nightly tests. If something is it can't be put in a continuous integration test, see if you can do it as a nightly test. And then even more rigorous maybe as you're trying to um, put something out to the public. And what is the frequency of these tests? Um, and what are your sanity checks? Just to know real quickly if a commit is gonna be good or not, that type of thing. And then practice peer code review. Uh, you could do it per commit. That might be uh, those you should be able to, Every commit should meet standards uh, and be understood by the reviewer, or at least at a, a pull request point, uh, some point in the process, make sure that it's uh, you go through the peer code review uh, to make sure that you have quality, um, that things are not breaking uh, in another area. Uh, take a retrospective, or if you have a lot of unreviewed code, we've been asked about that a lot today, so um, you can break it into to parts and do some of it, um, you can look over at what isn't covered and, and pick out parts, maybe isolated as uh, David suggested. It's easy to say who one of them is because <laughs> I'm not gonna get it wrong. <laughs> they do, but <laughs> they might, but I don't. <laughs> so, no, David Brunholt did suggest that. <laughs> um, other things during development, Make sure you understand the numerics of your code. I think we have a, the talk after this is on that, so that'll be interesting to listen to. Um, you have, of course, floating point numbers are just approximations. So you need to be able to do an analysis on um, what's coming out of that. And a lot of these methods have their own quirks, so you need to understand that or have maybe um, someone that's a domain scientist help you with that. Um, of course, if you're using reduced or mixed precision, precision precision computations, um, try to compare it with the full precision version, uh, either on paper while you're developing the algorithms, or maybe you can put in a path that will do this uh, when you can, so that you can compare those results. And then also you might, you need to consider the effects of non-determinism and concurrency, especially with all these different uh, runtime systems that we're using for the um, concurrent, um, calculations and putting things on GPUs. Um, these type, those types of concur concurrency can cause results that are different because things are being done in a different order, possibly. Um, so it could be that you might have to have an option that actually forces this deterministic um, computation. And then you could have some type of testing and verification method that um, that's that your results are coming out correctly. Um, but one run may not do that because concurrency can uh, change the order every time you run it. So you may have to force it in certain areas to run in certain orders. Um, know your error bounds and develop tests against them. I think David talked about this a little bit. And then uh, consider, again, uh, talking to your subject matter uh, domain experts and get them to help you with it. I guess that last point is don't always make, you might not always want to make assumptions that you know exactly what's going on in the, the domain. Um, after development, of course, testing. We talked about testing a lot, but it's, it's very important. Add regression tests when you fix a bug. Again, at this point, you're usually looking, you know what you want to do to make sure that bug doesn't, um, that that bug has been fixed. So 
at that point, that's when you could create a test and put it into your regression SL. Uh, you can add more tests. Think about the corner case and the con case. Think about the person who uh, might misuse it unintentionally um, or intentionally. I had a person walk up to me and tell me, I can break your software. And I'm like, is that your job? You know, I don't know if you could prevent him from doing that, but I did let him know that that wasn't really his job. But if he found any bugs, please let me know. <laughs> um, think about synthetic tests using synthetic data. How can you exercise uh, your algorithms with that? Uh, what about low cost tests? I'll talk about some that can always be on an amendment. Um, but if you have some that are not stringent and don't cost you a lot, maybe you could have those on all the time. And then uh, um, do you know if there's any silent data corruption? David Rogers talked a lot about uh, testing your third party dependencies. You need to know uh, what the tools are doing and if they're doing what you expected them to. Uh, what happens if their version has changed? You need to decide when you should incorporate that and uh, when you should upgrade that. And uh, David Rogers also talked about uh, testing tests, <laughs> make sure they fail when they should and that they're putting out the proper error uh, message so you can find out what happened. Um, th th thoroughly verify the code. Does it do what you intended it to? And does it do that on all the platforms like that example just between Linux and, and um, Mac? Do they, th will it run on all the platforms correctly that you are now starting to run on? This is becoming real important as we uh, change to the uh, different types of GPUs and different um, clusters and you may be running on uh, multiple ones. And then test regularly and document where uh, the changings, what happens when you change an underlying platform? If an error creeps up, make sure you document that or any kind of behavior or result. That could be from a compiler or a hardware architecture or even a, if you're using a new um, concurrency runtime. Okay, then you have to consider, uh, I believe um, David went into this somewhat on the uh, physics or your math, 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 <laughs> math based testing strategies. Um, use synthetic operators that have known properties. And then you can um, look at the different things that are important with that, such as spectrum and rank. Um, what are the invariance principles uh, for translations and location, whatever you're doing in your uh, model or uh, your simulation or other types of scientific codes. What are the physical and mathematical symmetries? And then of course, are, is it uh, adhering to the conservation rules for your particular software? Here's another little thing to think about is contract programming. You could build this testing into your routines. This isn't really to replace other testing. These types of things can be always on. Um, so every routine can be thought of as a contract between the caller and the callee. Uh, so what does the routine expect as preconditions? What are the inputs? If those are in proper, uh, uh, make sure you have a way to guarantee that. Uh, if those pre preconditions are not satisfied, then the routine should return an error. And then what are the routines guaranteed at completion? Um, you could have some low cost tests for um, the results from known preconditions for that. Um, you might need to be able to switch these type of, ex if the tests become expensive, you might be want to include something where you can turn them on or off so that maybe during certain testing cycles you have them on. Um, and or if a routine is changed, it, that one goes on for um, a certain test, that type of thing. So make sure that um, this, that, okay, so with these routines, you may have, they might be reused in another context. And so that makes that very important. Or they might be used by somebody who's not familiar with them. And so they actually use the wrong kind of inputs or they expect an invariant to change and it doesn't or 
or somehow they change it by changing that. And we have a test that says, wait a minute, this shouldn't, this value shouldn't have changed. <laughs> Seems like I had this already. Oh, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> okay. Um, also, you need to know what you're going to do in an experimental campaign, why you're doing it, and how. And one, th so you need to plan ahead. Make sure, especially on these really expensive campaigns, uh, make sure that you designate one person to coordinate it if it's a large uh, effort. That way, one person is the key person for everyone else to go to. Um, you need to know what you need in, as far as your code, your inputs, uh, your outputs, what you're going to capture and analyze, and how you're going to process uh, the results and how you're going to analyze them. So you want to know what to expect. Uh, it's really nice to know if you have a long campaign, how long it's going to take. Um, will you need to have checkpoint restart, that type of thing? Um, and then how are you going to convince yourself and those others who uh, are, are that it's important to that the results are uh, good and trustworthy? So one thing you can do is to build confidence in this a type of, especially in a large campaign, is to do some scaling up. Um, so you may start with some smaller scale tests and scale up and see that Yes, um, it looks like it'll take a certain amount of time and you know how much it's going to cost and you can kind of judge by that. Um, also, you need to ensure that you have the resources to store and analyze your data. Uh, how much can you afford to archive? So what are you going to archive that will fit in those spaces? Um, what can you process and delete uh, to make sure that you fit into those spaces? And then what do you need to process during execution? Uh, some tests require that, uh, quite a few that might be live streamed and you have to actually see what's going on. Other, um, during experiments, you want to know that you can reproduce the code that you use for each and every experiment. And can you, can you reproduce that three years later? So did you keep track of that in some form? Um, one thing that would help is to use only well-defined versions of the code, use official releases or tags, um, and you don't want to just say, oh, I used the main branch. Well, that's often changing, or the develop branch. Those are moving targets, so you want to pin down what you actually used. Um, and if that's in the output that helps, um, make sure that the code that you're building is actually in the repository. Uh, don't change versions during a related series of experiments. There may be a time when you see that something has to be fixed and you have to do it, but make sure you keep track of all that. And um, make sure you know exactly what changed and then capture the exact version used for each experiment. Use only versions of code that have been thoroughly verified. <laughs> That's very important. And then use regular testing to identify changes that are due to the under Line platform, we're talking about anything that uh, uh, we've seen compiler releases with optimizations that change the results. So we need to really keep track of, of what you're using. And that goes back to when did you decide to upgrade also. Um, so you also should probably uh, keep track of the versions of your key libraries and compilers and any other dependencies that are used uh, to build the code. This isn't done very often in practice, but it's a good practice to start. Um, so also during the experiments, be thorough in capturing provenance for um, what you're doing during using all the codes, the inputs and outputs, the transformation you're using with the code, capture the code version, all inputs and configuration for each experiment, and one thing that we haven't talked too much about in here, at least I don't remember talking about it too much, is, um, well, one thing that helps is having the systematic directory and file naming convention so you can find uh, the results. But also uh, separate written notes, either electronically or handwritten, especially when there's um, any uh, manual 
or human interaction should be taken care of. And then use scripts to orchestrate these experiments. And if you do, version those and capture them. And then um, you can even have version control for data if it's not too large. Capture all your important outputs. But you can. After experiments, you want to continue provenance capture through the uh, analysis and reduction process. So again, you want to capture codes that you use, any inputs, outputs, and any transformations that you might perform on the data. Script as much of that as you can. Um, scriptable tools are preferred over human uh, interaction. And if you do that, keep them under version control. Then document the process. And that's separate from your script. So again, paper or electronic notebook, um, especially when you have human interaction. And then capture your key intermediates. Uh, the more you capture, the more evidence you'll have to help you find problems that occurred uh, later. And also for verification, if anybody wants to see what you did. Um, capture the data in a machine readable form that you use to produce any of your graphs or uh, tables. Uh, this is expected by most of the data management plans and many publishers are now requiring it. Uh, we have some, there are some tools to help you with reproducibility. Um, quite a few people have talked about containers to capture the software, that's, that's one way. Um, and then there's uh, resources for understanding boiling point math uh, this floating point analysis tool um, is uh, one place you can look. And like I said, there's a talk about that after this. Um, also, you can use the cloud platforms for publishing code and data, such as CodeOcean, and then DOIs for um, code data documents uh, at Sonado and BigShare. Uh, make sure that you understand those tools uh, thoroughly before you use them capture something that's really important. Make sure your team members understand how to use them. So in summary, again, the credibility of your science comes from the credibility of your code and your process. And science stakeholders are uh, ratcheting up their expectations for the reproducibility. And you can use strategies that uh, I went through for all the phases during and after development and both during and after the experiments. This about amounts to better software development practices. And that's what we're talking about here. We want, we're trying to improve productiv productivity, sustainability, and maintainability through these practices. And there are some other resources you can look at, and these are on the resources site, too. So are there any questions? Any questions 